thank you very much for inviting me, and it's a great feeling to be here. Um, I have to admit that uh, the last time I was at the Irish Environment Agency, it was on their 10th birthday. So that's almost 20 years ago. But now I'm here, and thank you. Uh, and I'm going to rush a bit through the presentation because some things already have been said. And, uh, but I have to admit, my maybe even a bit more conceptual or theoretical. Um, and my only excuse, I have to borrow from Albert Einstein, who said that nothing is more practical than a good theory. So uh, that's the presentation. And uh, it has already been mentioned by several speakers that uh, the time is urgent, and uh, last time I was here, I was told that this uh, wisdom, if I were you, I wouldn't start from here, was an old Irish wisdom of people asking at the wrong time for the right way. So we come a bit late. Um, my first conceptual issue is what is the circular economy? Because the point simply is that if we maximize the amount of uh, substances or stuff which is being um, circulating in the economy, that doesn't help the environment at all. It only helps if we reduce the extraction of resources from the environment, then we can have the circular use and have less environmental impact and at the same time significant output of uh, benefits to humans. To explain the difficulties a bit, I use the famous put-put model. You know, on the left-hand side, we have organic input into the system. On the right-hand side, you see that we have both um, useful products on the one hand and waste on the other hand. And uh, that is processed by the famous put-put, which is our economy. And the, Recycling effort is then the challenge to turn the egg shells into worms again, which is not necessarily easy. So let's go a step further. Uh, we have on the left-hand side the recycling uh, business, which I call the re-economy, as compared to the throughput economy. But on the other hand, we also have a kind of what I call de-economy, de dematerialization, decentralization. So that is trying to reduce the flows of uh, resources inside the anthropos anthroposphere, so the economy and society, and on the other hand, reduce the flows into it. I think we must have both to be successful, and there is some elements uh, and recent studies I'm going to present you the results um, later on. So for me, the broader econ uh, circular economy is combining both, reducing the flows into and the flows inside the anthroposphere or the economy. That's some results from a study which is not yet published. Um, they analyze which sectors, products, and materials are conducive for a circular economy, which measures have the greatest impacts, what are the uh, environmental, economic, and social impacts, and which policy instruments can be used. So they analyze almost everything. And uh, some preliminary results, it is now here about measures for reducing resource consumption. You see that the most important measure is reducing passenger car stock, reducing living and office space. Um, and if you look all through them, only the cement recycling is traditional circular economy recycling, <coughs> whereas most of the other things are reducing consumption. That is sufficiency and some efficiency in resource-efficient IT. Uh, taking uh, this into account, you see that the black curve, unfortunately it's in German, the black curve is a total heating energy uh, per capita, and the efficiency, it's the pink curve, is uh, showing that the heat demand per square meter of living room is strictly going down. At the same time, the area, the housing area we occupy per capita is strictly going up. It's a yellow curve. 
And as a result, there is no significant reduction of energy consumption. So it's the volume of our consumption which is causing the problems. Uh, this is a measures which have been uh, used, uh, have been shown to be most efficient for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Then it's reducing living and office space, reducing passenger car stock. It is reducing textile consumption because, as you mentioned, it's not because things are broken. They're simply outdated and they are thrown away. So fast fashion is a crime, crime against the environment. Um, Resource-efficient IT comes up again, and uh, something which is quite different is planetary health diet, eating healthily. I remember when we did a study on sustainable Europe some decades ago, uh, our Italian friends translated that, and that was the point where they added a footnote saying, this does not mean that we recommend this kind of funny diet to any Italian citizen. It is just for calculation purposes. So I think this has had a lot to do with the cultural situations. Uh, but uh, what is a healthy diet is not a very new issue. Uh, it has been discussed for a long time. And uh, there is currently many people talking about veganism and uh, not, not consuming any kind of cows anymore, which would be a pity because cows and other ugloids are the animals which are responsible for keeping soils fertile and enhancing soil biodiversity. Yeah? But this is only true, of course, for those who are really grazing, not those in the stables which never go out and are there for high production. So 50 to 75 percent of our cows should go away for environmental reasons, and the rest we need on the fields and grazing. So what would happen if these measures were implemented? It's also quite interesting. We have a standard mistake in the public debate that everybody compares scenarios with the status quo, not taking into account that the status quo will not remain. Uh, we have to compare the status quo with the business as usual, and uh, then we see that a circular economy approach um, does not necessarily affect the gross added value too much how much, whether it's significantly lower or even a bit higher than the business as usual, depends on the rebound effects, which, we, uh, which are hard to calculate. The same is uh, the labor demand. There is not significantly less labor demand. So that is a point that you have seen. In most cases, the most effective measure to reduce the environmental impact is consuming less. So that is what we call sufficiency. And sufficiency is uh, in the circular economy probably the elephant in the living room, and the elephant is quite frustrated because of being ignored. <coughs> the second point, the uh, second part of my presentation is understanding human needs um, and theories of consumer behavior and why they fail. So first of all, understanding human needs. Human needs are not, as economists claim, infinite. They are limited in number. What is infinite is the satisfiers. Economy offers to meet human needs. Huh? And many of the human needs can better be fulfilled by social processes, like security, like being uh, comfortable, uh, than by material goods which are being sold to us with a promise to fulfill this kind of human need, which they usually not do. So sufficiency, consuming less, is not about suppressing human needs. It's about identifying the least environmental impacting satisfiers to meet the human needs. And uh, the theories have just already been mentioned, so I can be very short. One point is the theory of planned behavior, that is rational decision making. And uh, I just want to mention that I do not want to call every decision which is not in line with this as irrational. It's simply that humans, in 90% of all cases, if not more, do not make a conscious decision. They just do what is a habit, what is normal, what they have done all the time. And uh, if we would make a, a clear decision, a rational decision, each time we take a decision, we could not survive. Imagine that you think very carefully how you put your foot forward when walking you will never arrive anywhere. Huh? 
So it's not irrational, it's the efficiency of the human brain that most of the decisions we take are um, routine decisions, and that is why uh, only in certain circumstances where things are changing in, in the normal way of things, people take a new rational decision and then the rational criteria come in, but in all the other cases they simply don't. Uh, Many of the things are determined by social practices, and then there's the social practice theory. But this social practice theory is uh, helping us to understand how the uh, interaction with our social environment is. But on the other hand, it, mot it, it neglects the motivation, which you also already mentioned. So none of the theories is really satisfactory. And the um, appeal to save it, save it, save it, the economic uh, argument, uh, seems to be working in many cases, but if you save money, you spend it later on. So having the double benefit is identical with causing rebound effects. So that is unavoidable. Uh, a very important element already has been mentioned as well. That is a perceived behavioral um, control and the self-efficiency. Whether you are able really to make a difference. And I think this is a very important point we have to take into account in the current time. Because in the succession of crises, from the financial crisis, through the COVID crisis, through the war crisis, and whatever we had in between, the inflation crisis, um, people have been getting the feeling that they are no longer in control of their own lives. So they are withdrawing to small groups where they feel that the group is a group which understands them and gives them more safety or security. But that is the exact opposite of what we need in a democratic transition because it undermines societal discourses and replaces them by echo chambers of like-minded people. So I see that as the most dangerous development for the democracy in our countries. And without democracy, I cannot imagine how we could uh, implement a meaningful decision uh, about sustainable development and circular economy. Uh, some very rational suggestions are not immediately picked up, as you can see right there. Uh, although I find it absolutely convincing. Uh, and then the next point is that if we have solved one problem, we run into the next one. So let's talk about the change of practices. It must be affordable, and that is my conceptual approach. Affordability in several dimensions. First of all, it must be socially affordable, because if you drop out of your peer groups because they do not accept your behavioral change, you have a significant loss of quality of life. The second thing is that must be economically affordable, because if you cannot afford it, if your money isn't there, then you have to borrow money for that or pretend you're doing something, it won't work out. So social effects are extremely important in this respect. Um, the next point is that we have um, the um, motivational, so the, the subjective affordability, does that behavior fit to me? And that goes beyond both the theories we heard about. And finally, the formal institutional, uh, what is legally allowed, what is a framework, that is what is open to government. And then this means it becomes a pretty complex interaction of things, and that is something which is usually uh, not taken into account. If you, if you leave out one or the other dimension, you will not have success. I'm coming to the end because the machine tells me so. Um, that is a slide I copied from a presentation I heard about a couple of weeks ago. It says that on the left-hand side, it's not very easily readable. Access to social media contributes to increased consumption. And they have uh, shown that digital media advertising and marketing is driving it. The social pressure to uphold lifestyles, that is a peer group issue again. Instant certification, you order in the internet, and yeah, it's on the way to you. And finally, the influencer culture. That is something I just quote, because I always thought influencer is a disease. 
May maybe it is, but... <coughs> so, coming to the end, um, when we talk about a good life, we need to talk about sufficiency, about less consumption, but that can be a better life because life is more than work by consume and die. And that is the end of this presentation. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>